Speaking is going to be Mark Green. I believe he's sitting right there. Yep. He is from Plymouth State University and the U.S. Forest Service, and he's going to be talking about tracking trajectories and sensitivities in forest water use. Let me get this. Hopefully it won't be cut off for you. Yeah, let's see. Uh, yeah, so Jamie's illusion, or, you know, pointing out that evapotranspiration is the dominant water flux uh, off of the land surface on Earth. Uh, I'm going to dig deeper into that um, by looking at evapotranspiration dynamics within the northeastern uh, forest. Perfect. I'm so sorry about that. Let's see. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll run with it. <laughs> yep, yep. Um, so what I'm going to do with this talk is we're going to start at the small scale, basic drivers, and then we're going to go large scale, and then we're going to come back down to small scale. So if we start at the small scale, if you look at the bottom of a leaf on really any of the trees in the northeast, you're going to see a cell that looks like this. This is a stomate. Um, bottom of a leaf has thousands, hundreds of thousands of stomates per leaf, and they look like mouths. That's actually the entomology of the word, st of the, the word stomate, uh, and that mouth is for a gas exchange. This cell, or, or this uh, um, uh, complex, opens up to exchange gases, and really it's opening up because it wants to take in CO2 so that it can do photosynthesis. As a consequence of opening that stomate, it's 100% relative humidity in there, water escapes. So depending on what the weather is like uh, on the outside of, of the stomate, that's going to drive how much water is going to be diffusing out when it opens up to do photosynthesis. And so if we think about then what the drivers are for this, the drivers are concentration of uh, carbon dioxide. So as carbon dioxide concentration increases outside of that stomate, we're going to see greater diffusion or faster diffusion out of the, the stomate. If the concentration of water goes up on the outside of that stomate, we're actually going to see a slower loss when it's open. Uh, so, so a couple things to keep in mind as I talk through some of the large-scale drivers, concentration of CO2 and water vapor are, are major controls on, on an individual stomate and how it operates. Um, why does it open and when does it close? Well, if it's, try, if it's opening up to take in carbon dioxide to do photosynthesis, light is a major, major driver. And so at night, these are going to close. Uh, if we're in a cloudy day, they're going to be less likely to, to open. Um, also, there are some strategies that plants have evolved to, to use where if they experience water stress, if the pressure in the xylem of the tree, for example, example, gets a little bit too difficult to deal with or there's not enough soil water, they're going to close the stomate so that they can prevent themselves from wilting. Uh, so that's one of the reasons that, we might, that they might close. The other is just photosynthesis. Uh, if there's not enough nitrogen, if the tree is not particularly uh, well nurtured, it's going to close the stomate because it just can't move the sugars uh, fast enough or, or synthesize sugars. So this tiny little system uh, on the bottom of leaves has major implications at, at the larger scale. So I think about stomates, but this is where I, I work. So this is a, a photo from Google, um, Google Maps looking at a carpet of trees uh, in the Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest. And so as you might imagine, thinking about what I just uh, went through with stomates, I, you know, let's just do the quick back of the envelope calculation as to how many stomates there are. You know, if they're 400 per square millimeter, LAI is about six, so about six layers of leaves. So then per square meter, we're talking about 2.4 billion of these stomates. Some are a little bit more shaded than others. Some are in better uh, nutrient status soils. And so you can imagine how complicated this becomes at saying, what, how stomates are going to function, and then how that's going to scale up to regional scale or even plot scale uh, hydrologic dynamics. And this has been shown, uh, you know, the, the implications of these stomates at large scales has been shown, um, particularly because of this newer work uh, from, from new isotopic data that's shown that, you know, Jamie mentioned that most of the water flux is via evapotranspiration. 
and evapotranspiration, that word is built of evaporation and transpiration, well really we should be saying transpiration, or at least 80% of that water flux globally from the land surface is through these stomates. It's not off of ponded water surfaces. And so these stomates and how they function has major global consequences that's already been demonstrated in the literature. Um, the, the top left there is a New York Times article that showed uh, how increasing CO2 concentrations are actually causing less water fluxes off of our land surface uh, here in the northeastern uh, US. This bottom paper then goes the next step, and if we have less evapotranspiration leaving through these stomates, that means wetter soils, and that means higher river flows. And so this study from 2006 showed globally, it seems like there's increasing stream flows and the mechanism that they invoke is increasing CO2 concentration. So these stomates don't have to be open as often. And so stream flow actually ends up going up because of this. That's the water story there, that's the water background. I just want to touch on one other background point, and this is a, a picture from uh, Jim Gauze's energy budget. What we're looking at here on the left, that RN is solar radiation coming into the Hubbard Brook forest. Of that light that doesn't get reflected back, it leaves the forest primarily via two pathways. It either radiates heat or that water that gets evaporated or moved through the stomate that's more than 50% of the heat. So the forest is shedding heat much like we do when we sweat. That water vapor has major, major implications for the heating of this surface as well. So a change in evapotranspiration is not just a change in the hydrologic cycle, it's a change in the temperature of this forest, which then has myriad consequences. Okay, so with that context, uh, let's talk hydrology. Uh, so in order to track evapotranspiration historically, places like the Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest, Sleepers River, other small catchments uh, were established where we could constrain the amount of precipitation coming into a land surface. We could measure the stream flow leaving it, but ultimately the main question that they were after early on was evapotranspiration because you can calculate that based on the difference between uh, the precip coming in and the stream flow leaving. And so a large group of us uh, that work at small catchments uh, got together and, and recently published a paper on evapotranspiration trends across the northeastern U.S. And so the upside down triangles here uh, are small watersheds across the northeast. Sleepers River that, that Jamie mentioned is there, Hubbard Brook. Uh, down at the bottom, I guess we're missing the Furnell Forest. That's the furthest south down in West Virginia. So we mix those with large watersheds that the U.S. Geological Survey monitors the discharge from, we used large-scale precipitation estimates to do the same thing, say, what's the stream flow out, what's the precip in, and then what might be the evapotranspiration, and look at the trends over a 70-year time period. And so when we take a look at the large watersheds, the significant trends are these three arrows that pop up. Two in the northern extent of our domain, uh, up in Maine, those showed significantly increasing evapotranspiration. And then this watershed on the Ohio-Pennsylvania uh, border showed a, a significant decrease in evapotranspiration. If we take a look at the experimental watersheds, uh, two showed significant changes. Uh, the one you see in the bottom left there is uh, the Furneaux Experimental Forest that showed a decrease. And then Biscuit Brook in New York and the Catskills showed an increase. So there's maybe a trend starting to emerge. Until we look at Hubbard Brook, we included two watersheds at Hubbard Brook. Uh, one on a south-facing slope had a decreasing evapotranspiration trend. And one on a north-facing slope, just on the other side of, a, of the valley, had a significant increasing trend in evapotranspiration. And so maybe, we still haven't been able to explain this yet, but maybe it's part of this larger story that our more, our cooler, more energy limited watersheds, like the ones in Maine and maybe the north facing slope in the Hubbard Brook Valley, as that limitation is being eased by climate change, we're seeing evapotranspiration increase, uh, where in the warmer environment, other drivers are causing a significant decline in evapotranspiration.
If we want to dig into mechanisms, though, of what's driving these changes, I'm going to present a few data sets uh, here from uh, Eddie Flux Towers. And so these towers, I'm, I'm going to use data from three that measure evapotranspiration at a half hour basis. They actually are measuring the turbulence of air and the water vapor loss uh, associated with that turbulence 10 times a second in order to really characterize the turbulence, but, but we summarize them at, at a half hour uh, time step. And so here's, here's a picture of, of me maintaining the, the one that we've established at the Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest only in the last couple years. Uh, I'll show one uh, from Howland Forest in Maine uh, that has a, a record going uh, over a decade now that's uh, maintained by the University of, of Maine uh, and Dave Hollander from the U.S. Forest Service. And then the Bartlett Experimental Forest, uh, not too far from Hubbard Brook here, that has uh, an eight to, to nine year record. And so what's great about these flux tower data is that you can now get a picture of seasonal evapotranspiration dynamics using you know, all the half hour data. Uh, these are from the, the Howland Experimental Forest. Uh, and we can then look at what are the climate drivers? What was the weather like for every half hour? And start to do some correlations to see what is driving evapotranspiration at these three sites. And so just to keep in mind, that stomate. Again, I just want to remind us that we're, we, I'm going to use variables that control photosynthesis, so is the stomate open, and then what is the vapor gradient outside of that stomate? So how, how much atmospheric demand is there for water if that stomate is open uh, to drive evapotranspiration? So, three sites. Uh, the first thing I did was, was took a look at three, uh, at the three towers uh, and look at just the correlation. How tight is the correlation between the t uh, at the three sites, uh, net radiation, vapor pressure deficit, uh, CO2 flux, air temperature, uh, wind speed, and soil moisture. And so let's just, I, I list them in that order because that's sort of the ranked importance of these drivers that emerges from these flux towers. Um, net radiation is the strongest driver uh, of evapotranspiration. Soil moisture or water availability matters hardly at all. Okay, so that's sort of the big, big picture story. Uh, CO2 flux, productivity of the site is sort of intermediate. It's maybe not quite as important uh, as net radiation or vapor pressure deficit, that, that atmospheric demand for water. And I include temperature here just because it's what we can predict best with climate change, even though it's not really a direct driver of these evapotranspiration changes. And so the next step that I went with this, okay, this tells us how tight those relationships are, but let's, what about the sensitivity using the slope of these relationships? And what emerges if we pose the question, what if we have a 1% increase in the four major drivers? What percent change in evapotranspiration would we see? And so this is a little bit startling. So I, I, this is you know, a relatively new analysis that we're still trying to verify, but net radiation, a 1% increase in net radiation is gonna result, based on these models, these, these statistical models, anywhere from four to 8% increase in evapotranspiration. Uh, vapor pressure deficit is in the three to 4% increase range. Uh, and then CO2 flux and temperature are in the one to 2% range. But all of them show that any, a 1% change in any of those drivers has a disproportionate uh, increase in, in evapotranspiration. So net radiation, the physical drivers, uh, the, the main message here is the physical drivers and the atmospheric demand seem to, to really drive uh, the, the, evapo the regional evapotranspiration uh, dynamics and are potentially responsible for those trends that I presented earlier. So some take home uh, points, I'll just mention these. Uh, colder environments seem to be more sensitive in, in terms of uh, increasing evapotranspiration uh, to, to what is potentially an alleviation of energy limitation uh, within that northern extent that is not happening at the southern extent. Something else is happening at that southern extent. <laughs> um, 
these flux tower data are really allowing us to, to dig deeper into understanding what the potential mechanisms are. And I'll just note, uh, I've presented a couple from New Hampshire, uh, one from Maine, uh, there are a bunch in Massachusetts, there are zero flux towers in Vermont, so at least that I'm aware of, so somebody correct me, there are none associated with the Ameriflux network, so there's, there's a need there to understand this. And then the final is that it's not straightforward to study these trends because there are feedbacks in the system. Evapotranspiration, if we just draw the arrows, you know, photosynthesis, relative humidity, and net radiation with temperature as maybe a secondary driver. Well, one of the, if we see evapotranspiration increase or decrease, it has an impact on relative humidity, and more water vapor in the atmosphere has an impact on net radiation, which evapotranspiration is super sensitive to. So it's not straightforward as to what we're uh, going to expect or, or how to predict these changes in evapotranspiration. So um, I will just jump here and acknowledge, hopefully those, yeah, they're, they're reasonable, uh, reasonable to see. Um, all the data and, and, and the collaborators that I've worked with are on here are listed here, and here are our funding sources. Uh, it can't happen without a big group of people studying the hydrologic cycle within the region. So with that, uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks. I mean, that, that's what we're hunting for right here. And really the challenge is we still don't have enough meteorological data in these environments to be able to understand those drivers. I mean, we can put temperature and relative humidity sensors beneath the canopy very easily, but getting something up above the canopy that's largely the driver, that's the, the huge challenge. So um, we're working on it, but Given these complexities, we're, we're probably a ways away from being able to come up with that quite yet. Yeah. Yeah, Jamie. So all four of the variables you showed had a positive influence? Yeah, well, what I, I had done for the analysis was a 1% increase in yeah. each of those resulted in a positive change in evapotranspiration. And you're getting your CO2 flux from the tower as well, right? That's right. It's direct. It's measuring not just the water loss, but the CO2 pulled down. Yeah. Yeah, so productivity is less of a driver than the atmospheric demand for water uh, is sort of a take-home message, a preliminary one that seems to be emerging. Yeah. You had mentioned uh, earlier that there are two watersheds, I believe, in the, um, I forget which uh, At Hubbard Brook. Maybe? Yes. Yeah, okay. And one was higher, one was lower, and it was aspect related. Uh, the one that had the 8% uh, the increase was at the more southerly aspect dominant uh, watershed. Was there a correlation there? And that 8% increase was uh, in the main, is at the main site, which is, you know, I get, it's not the coolest. I'm, I'm not certain. It's, so it's not aspect related there. I, I'm not certain. The follow up question is how, how much analysis do you do on, I'm sure aspect is probably the biggest driver, but elevation and slope probably also a factor in there somewhere. They potentially could, but if, this, if it's by far the most sensitive to net radiation, actually aspect may be more important than those because just because if you're in, on a northern aspect, you're getting significantly less net radiation. Thank All right. you. Yep.